But no. No, we've got to roast Mr. Excitement here. You know how hard this is going to be, folks? This is a guy whose idea of a good time is to sit on a toilet till his legs go numb. It can be said that he's frugal. We can work on that. He's slightly frugal. I mean, he took his grandson to Benny Hanna's to be circumcised. <laughs> Are you smoking or electing a pope down front here? because he's afraid if the plane lands safely, he's been cheated. <laughs> I've been told that. I don't know. Is that true? They say that when you go out to dinner, you order prune juice for an appetizer so you won't be around when the check comes. Is that right? But he survived, he, he actually surprises every one of us with his vigor and his energy. When he's at an age when it takes two Anison to make a fist. <laughs> but he has the energy. I, uh, I read in this program, this is great, how handsome you were. Did you read that in the program? It says right here that you are handsome. I wrote it. You wrote it. <laughs> But you goofed up. You put your picture in there with the remark. <laughs> However, he does pride himself somewhat as a ladies' man. Just in the cocktail party earlier, a lady came up and said to him, you are the handsomest musician I have ever seen. And then she turned around and walked into a wall. <laughs> A poor boy from the south side of Chicago, I can identify with that. He grew up in Roseland, I grew up in Harvey. I came from a poor family, but so did this gentleman. His whole family was wiped out when automatic pin setters came in. <laughs> talk about his Italian background because I am Italian, I'm Irish and Italian, and I despise comedians that come on stages and, and stereotype nationalities in our society. I find it the lowest form of humor. And if you're Irish and Italian, there are many stereotypes for that, so I won't bring that up. I mean, just because some Italian people in the mafia doesn't mean all Italian people in the mafia. Just because some Irish people drink doesn't mean all Irish people are drunks. However, most Puerto Ricans will steal your hubcaps. <laughs> with you. I, I honestly admire the Greeks. I've always felt that's a great, great heritage. Greek people are so proud of the fact they're Greek. Whenever you meet a Greek man, whatever his name is, he'll tell you he's a Greek. If his name is Nick, he's Nick the Greek. If his name is Jimmy, he's Jimmy the Greek. I play golf at a country club. A guy named Steve has it painted on his golf bag. Steve the Greek. You never see a golf bag that says Irving the Jew. <laughs> pickup truck that says Tyrone, the black guy on the side of it. <laughs> I knew a lot of guys from Rosalind. I caddied at Ravislow Country Club in Homewood, Illinois, and uh, it was a marvelous experience for me. A lot of the kids from Bumtown caddied there. And the membership, of course, was all Jewish, and I learned so much from those wonderful men and women. I learned that my sister is a shiksa. <laughs> and that I was a goy. I have an aunt who's a yenta. Her husband's a schmuck. I 
I wouldn't have known these things had I not carried that around. So. I used to get it for Mr. Stein out at Ravistel Country, who was a wonderful man, he really was, but even his wife suspected that he was anti-Catholic, and yet on his deathbed, he said to her, I want a priest. And she said, you want to convert to Catholicism? And he said, yes, better that one of them dies. <laughs> I've known Johnny Frigo for a long time. Now, a lot of you don't know, you always associate him with the violin. He played stand up bass for many years. You still play the bass? Yeah, occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. I remember he played with a trio, and the guy who owned the bar told me about it. He said one night they were ready to do the set. It was piano, bass, stand up bass, and drums, and they couldn't find Johnny, and they went out in the alley, and there he was beating up this guy, just beating the hell out of this guy. And he said to him, Johnny, come on, we have to do the set. And he said, this son of a bitch loosened one of the pegs on my bass. And he kept beating the guy up, and he said, let him go, he's had enough. He said, not till he tells me which peg he loosened up. <laughs> clever boy who worked in a produce department in Roseland as a young boy and was always quick with his mind. It's a true story about Johnny when he was a young man, a guy six foot nine, about 325 pounds, walked into the produce department and said to Johnny, I want a half a head of lettuce. Oh. <laughs> Johnny turned around and walked to the store owner, not knowing that the guy followed him, and he said to the store owner, some asshole wants a half a head of lettuce. And he turned around and looked and he said, and this gentleman would like to have the other half. And the owner said, that's fast thinking after the guy left. He said, Johnny, I've never met anybody who can think as fast as you. I'd love to have you run one of my stores up in Canada. And Johnny said, Canada, all they have up there are hockey players and whores. And the guy said, my wife is from Canada. And Johnny said, no shit, what position does she play? <laughs> now, I don't want to stay up here and bore you with a lot of wonderful material. We have a long evening. It is great to be here, it truly is. Uh, I'm a big fan of Johnny Frigos, obviously. That's why I came all the way from California to be here, also because the Cubs were in town. <laughs> and the Bears. <laughs> no, it's great to be with Johnny. We're going to ro roll on here. We have a lot of good friends of Johnny's who have some nice things to say about him. I'd like to start with the first man up here. He's a composer and arranger, co-founder of Comtrack, uh, a leading jingle house here. And he's a long, long time friend. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, please, Dick Reynolds. <laughs> His great sense of humor. I, uh, I can't remember the singer's name, but one time we're seeing her rehearsing uh, the show, and we didn't have a time to go over the music, so we're over across the street. What was the name of that uh, restaurant right across the street? O'Connell's. That's it. So uh, we're sitting there, and we're looking over the music, and we're just running it down. And the uh, lady said she was real nervous. I said, "Well, just relax. Everything's going to be all right. All we have to do is feel you out." And John says, "Well, yeah. The first thing we have to do is run over your opening." <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that, I've got to say, this man has been the father in the business to me here in the city, and I owe a whole lot to him in my life, and I give him praise forever, and keep your good humor up, John. Thank you, Dick. You bet, buddy. Dick Reynolds. First, I've never had a hard time keeping it down. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. We, we wanted to start out with uh, someone that had less hair than you. Good, good, good role. I have a full head of hair. Did you hear that, folks? He said he has a full head of hair. This is a bald toupee he's wearing. Good joke. 
Next, we'd like to bring up a gentleman who's president of Universal Recording Studio. He's the head of NARIS, which is an acronym for National Association of Recording Arts and Sciences. Uh, he started out uh, as a musician. It says here he was a horny sax player. <laughs> no, he played horn. He, uh, sax, that's what he was. Mr. Murray Allen, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. One story, though, some of you have heard, but way, Johnny and I worked so many hours in the studio, nights and days and afternoons and Sundays and weekends. Well, I get this call from him, and he said, uh, this young girl singer I'm pushing, Sadie was her name. Oh, in case you don't know, her name is now Brittany. Before that, it was Marilyn. Before that, it was Marilyn. And before that, it was Sadie. <laughs> he says, the call came from New York City. And he said, we just finished recording this album. We've got to overdub it. He says, if you fly in real quick, can you overdub it? Well, this is back in the day, the four-track recording. So he comes in the studio about 8 o'clock at night. We're all exhausted and doing jobs day and night, day and night. He walks into this little scrubby piece of tape. It wasn't in a box. It was just a scrubby piece of tape he took out of his pocket. It was a nice little four-track tape. So in Universal back in those days, we never could find enough hubs. That's what you would wind the tape about to do the session. So I put the tape on the machine, I went to Studio B, couldn't find a hub. Went to C, couldn't find a hub. Walked back in A, and I saw this little scrappy piece of tape. I said, that will make a nice hub. I took a razor blade and I cut through the entire thing. And it fell in a nice clean waste basket, 365 pieces. And, uh, <laughs> now, that was the master, that's right. So, so, I, so I said to, uh, to Johnny, and I said to Marlon, I said, uh, why don't you just call New York and see if maybe this is a safety? Oh no, that's the master. So we thought, how can we put it back together again? So I figured, well, the long pieces would be on the outside, and the short pieces would be on the inside. Uh, but the biggest difference between the longest and shortest was about an eighth of an inch. You know? So then we decided, Johnny wrote the entire arrangement out, and he numbered lots of numbers. So we played each piece individually, and we psyched out where it went in the number system. Oh, and we ultimately put the entire thing together. And except we got all done, there was one little nick, and one little corn that was missing. And Johnny was walking around in the Stark studio, and he went, I think this is it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we put that in, and it worked. But I can tell you, Johnny, that wasn't it. It really wasn't. That was left over from a Duke Ellington session. And that's why when she won a Grammy, went up, to, it was Harry Carney that took the award. <laughs> Johnny took the award. as a matter of fact, was for Harry Carey in Las Vegas, uh, where they had a roast, which was somewhat interesting, because some of you may have been there. Um, Harry Carey brought just his friends to Las Vegas. Uh, and it was the first time <coughs> in the history of Las Vegas that they comped the gambling, but you had to pay for your drinks. <laughs> You know, if it flows down the middle, Harry will drink it. You know that, don't you? I don't want to knock Harry. I love Harry Carey. I hope he never dies. And if he does, I hope they don't cremate him because he'll burn forever. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to bring up a gentleman who's the disc jockey at WGN. He's the jazz promoter of all jazz promoters. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mike Rapchak. I see another friend of mine at table three, Marty Robinson. I have a friend. Marty Robinson is here. And Marty and I have known each other for a long time. Matter of fact, same station, he worked with us. Marty also doubled driving a cab, as I recall. Excuse right, Marty? me. What? Would you two like me to be alone? <laughs> talk about my relationship with Sylvia Sims. <laughs> but if I'm going to pick somebody out of a crowd, it's going to be in a heterosexual relationship, you know, not picking on Faye all the time. <laughs> she 
Please, this is your night, Marty. You swung all the way from here. <laughs> Marty and John Rose here. I can't here. Use the toilet. Yes. Somebody almost went into the toilet he came to use here just a few minutes ago. There was a... <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled always to be in a room full of musicians. My father played trumpet for 30 years and, uh, and bands all over the country. He never made the big time, but he was a great musician. And uh, oftentimes people would say to me, Oh, you can hear now? There we go. This is great. <laughs> isn't it great to be in a multi-million dollar hotel with a sound system from Kmart, isn't it? <laughs> How's that? There we go. But well, my father played trumpet, and I still at home with musicians. I always did. Uh, whenever I'd work with Mr. Calais or places like that, the Playboy Club, there was always the musicians who kept the comedians going. They were the, the great support system. Many people say to me, why didn't you... You know, did your father ever encourage you to go into show business? And I remember as a little boy that my dad would lay down in the living room. When I was five years old, he'd lay down a <coughs> trumpet and he'd lay down a shovel. And every time I'd reach for the trumpet, he'd hit me in the head with a shovel. <laughs> Speaking of musicians, orchestra leader, pianist, producer, and owner of Best Entertainment, Mr. Ed Bodega. Got it, Eddie. Hey. <laughs> I feel that feel that my job is to sort of pick up the pieces for some of the for some of the other folks. Uh, they've been so busy uh, rummaging around their dusty attics, pulling up John Frigo stories that. There were a few major things that uh, were omitted this evening. Now, uh, when you when you kicked off the dinner, you read a few telegrams, but you didn't. There, you you skipped a couple, which I had found uh, sitting over on the speaker. So uh, I have them here, John. And these are some messages that uh, that came in on your behalf. Uh, this one, I don't know how you could have missed this. This is from the president of the American Federation of Musicians, Marty Emerson, and it says. Although his career has spanned many decades, I first became aware of this extremely talented and gifted musician during the 1950s when he appeared regularly, regularly as one of the sage riders on the WLS National Barn Dance. I followed his career through the Barn Dance, moved to WGN, and then after the Barn Dance with his 20 plus years as leader of the musical wheels on WGN Radio Noon Show with Orion Samuelson, I can truly say here's one of the finest accordionists in the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Lino Frigo. That's, the, uh, that's our president of the Musicians' Union. Here's, here's, a, here's another one. Now, this came in, jeez, uh, I don't know where this has been. It says, Dear Johnny, your 15 minutes are up. Andy Warhol. And, uh, we, have, uh, we have another here. Yeah, would someone catch all of these, please? Yeah. Uh, we have one here. Let's see. Uh, Oh, this one must be uh, related to your Japan trip. You were just over in Tokyo, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this one, uh, this one is the uh, is the last telegram. It's from the uh, from the White House, the office of, office of the President, to the Society of Singers. You want me to do what? <laughs> And uh, now this letter came in, and we, we wanted to frame it uh, because it is uh, suitable for framing, as you can see. Uh, it's dated, uh, and this was sent actually to my home, and it was uh, in care of you. Uh, dated September 16th, 1989, uh, from Santa Barbara, California. Um, and uh, actually, oh, this is great. This is from the former first couple, Ron and Nancy Reagan. Dearest Johnny, congratulations on this a very special day. Both Nancy and I have always been fans of yours ever since we can remember. In fact, although we may be dating ourselves, I looked up to you from the time I was a child. I don't know that's a <laughs> the old humor in. I had, uh, I had hoped to be with you today, but as you know, my recent brain surgery is curtailing any travel. But rest assured, the doctors tell me that it hasn't affected my mind at all. So that's, that's good news. With that, in, with that in mind, uh, since Nancy and I could not be there in person, we wanted to commend you for the fine charitable work you have been doing in addition to your musical career. Many people do not know 
of the new global organization you are found in with Imelda Marcos, Corazon Aquino, Aquino, Ivan Boski, and Reverend Jim Baker to stop the senseless, senseless slaughter of seals on the coast of South Africa. <laughs> so, I don't know. John, you have many facets. Uh, keep up the good work, and as we used to say in the trouser business, go out and win one for the zipper. And finally, uh, there, there aren't superlatives enough to, to proclaim John's uh, greatness as a, as a poet, as a painter, uh, as a musician, as a writer. Um, but, in fact, recently we've been seeing a lot more of, uh, of the press reviews on his last two albums with, uh, with the, the Pizzarellis and with Monty Alexander. And, I don't know, in fact, uh, John, I think you, the last time you phoned me at three in the morning to read one of them to me, uh, I mean, they're great and everything, but, but I thought there must be more than this site. Every review has been glowing, and I can't help but think that somehow there was a little bit of editing that has gone on on John's part. And, and recently, uh, he was just out at a giant jazz festival in Denver, and I thought, uh, I have to just see like, if there's anything else floating around on John besides this positive hype that I keep getting. So, uh, with the help of uh, the doorman in his apartment building, I happened to, to sneak into your apartment, and I, you know, I hope you don't mind, rummaged a few, through a few things and, uh, and came up with these. Um, now, John really fancies himself, besides a musician, as a writer and as a poet. And he's very shy about it. It's something very personal to him. Uh, but I have found out that you have been trying to get things published, even though we, none of us uh, see this very much. And uh, this was a response uh, to uh, him sending out uh, his poetry to a publisher and submitting this, uh, this latest work of poetry. John got this response. Dear Mr. Frigo, I wish to thank you for your recent submission of poetry. Your work is interesting but uh, it is not without a few problems. For one, the first rule of spelling is that there is only one Z in is. So that, that could be a... And uh, then this on his violin playing, uh, a reviewer writes, uh, now I don't know why you never send these, a reviewer writes, uh, there are two ways of disliking the violin. One way is to dislike it, and the other is to hear John Frigo play it. <laughs> Uh, another reviewer writes of a recent concert appearance. I don't know where this was, but... Uh, there is less to John Frigo than meets the ear. <laughs> and uh, from his concert tour with the uh, uh, tribute to Duke Ellington in Japan, a uh, Japanese critic says, His style has the desperate jauntiness of an orchestra fiddling away for dear life on a sinking ship. <laughs> and uh, probably his, his, uh, his biggest... Uh, uh, his biggest smash so far is his latest album with Bucky and John Pizzarelli and it brought these last two reviews that I found uh, in your apartment. Uh, one critic writes, um, I didn't like the album but then I heard it under adverse conditions. The speakers were plugged in. <laughs> and and uh, finally, uh, here, this is uh, I think my favorite one, uh, this new release from Johnny Frigo is, is not an album to be tossed aside lightly. It should be thrown with great force. So. <laughs> So, John, uh, congratulations and much love. It's not easy doing a show sitting next to Marty Fay, I'll tell you. That. I'm a former altar boy. The guy's turned me into a real slut in the last half an hour, I'll tell you. <laughs> but Johnny's having a good time. He's, looks like Pa Kettle on Quaaludes. <laughs> Johnny, I, I, I was a new entertainer, and Johnny always had some advice for us. And I'll never forget working at Mr. Kelly's or anywhere. We for, actually, I didn't start out at Mr. Kelly's. When you got to Mr. Kelly's, that was the big time, you know. Uh, so we worked a lot of dives and crummy joints before we got there. But uh, it turned out to be a pretty crummy joint in the end. So it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> so, Johnny used to always give us, he always had some parable or some cliche to get you over the tough times. I remember his favorite saying was, I cried because I had no shoes, and then I, one day I saw a man with no feet. Now, I always thought that was kind of a dumb thing, but <laughs> years went by, and I was out in Hollywood. I was broke. I was down and out. I was walking up Hollywood Boulevard one day, and I didn't have any shoes, and I began to cry, and I saw a man with no feet. <laughs> and I said, you probably got some shoes laying around you're not using. <laughs> Now 
it's time to bring up another Italian. We have some Italians. This is a longtime friend. He's a pianist. A pianist and a former accordionist. That's what he says. Former. <laughs> Orchestra leader, Bon Vibon. I have no idea. I'm from Harvey. What is that? Bon Vibon. A gay accordionist. A gay accordionist. Oh. A bon Joe, this I believe of you. In his dressing room, he has a picture of Richard Simmons as a Marlboro man. <laughs> Joe Vito, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to me. The question is, uh, if you're standing on the top of the Empire State Building and you drop an accordion and a banjo at the same time, which one will hit the sidewalk first? And naturally, the answer is, who cares? <laughs> My good friend, uh, Freddie Wacker, uh, reminded me of a story. Uh, this is very difficult to, I don't mean to, I'm not a storyteller, and uh, you're doing a wonderful job, incidentally. Yeah, not, not fabulous, but <laughs> what the hell, you know, we worked it out, the price was right. How many of you remember Al Cohn, the uh, wonderful tenor saxophone player? Thank you, buddy. <laughs> uh, he was uh, going over to uh, do a recording session in New York, and uh, it was very strange, I mean, being an accordion player, I get on a lot of strange sessions. And, uh, but this one, uh, truthfully, had 50 mandolins and Al Cohen. Now, can you picture this? I mean, I can see 40, 35, but 50 is ridiculous. And uh, so uh, Al uh, goes in to play the session and uh, uh, the uh, engineer says, this is one of the strangest sessions I've ever seen. I mean, do, do, do you believe this? I mean, 50 mandolins. What, what, have you ever seen anything like this? And Al, Al Cohen says, he says, I've never seen anything like this before. He says, and I hope that no one from New Jersey needs a haircut this afternoon. <laughs> Did you understand that, Marty? I forgot. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot. Uh, Cup was uh, supposed to be here tonight, so he did call me this afternoon uh, and uh, began to uh, uh, relay. Oh, you blew the goddamn. John, will you shut up? <laughs> I'm telling you, these roasts are getting on my nerves. <laughs> Cup called me, and I just thought of this this morning, and I thought it would... <laughs> uh, he began to tell me, uh, th this is a real switch, and he began to tell me what he wanted me to tell John, and I fell asleep while he told me this, and I... So I didn't hear the message. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the last time for you. Uh, two stories, because uh, Tempest Bangarama asked. Uh, this is a true story. We all hear the story. John's a Renaissance man, and the poetry, and the paintings, and all that. I've done all that. But, uh, I mean, we've heard all that, and he's so wonderful, and we all love John, uh, most of us. But this is a true story that happened uh, in fact, uh, with Alan Barkas, what, how long, about four or five months ago, uh, John and I were on a recording session over at Streeterville. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, oh, Murray, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's that the other one, the other one. And uh, so it was early in the morning, and it was accordion, and uh, uh, the, the one that hits the sidewalk second, of course. 
uh, Cordian and John. We were going to do a thing for Alan. And uh, believe it or not, I don't know why I was there early this time. I don't know what happened. My wife, uh, something happened. Well, I know what happened. We cannot go into that. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry, dear. You know, I like to find that. Uh, so I get to Streeterville, I have the accordion, and uh, I bring it up, uh, you know, the, the world-famous elevator that uh, it's on the third floor right now. And uh, put the accordion up there, come down to go and get something to eat and, uh, for breakfast, and it's about 9 o'clock or 9.15, and, and uh, as I'm getting off the elevator, John uh, is standing there r ready to go up. I said, John, we've got quite a bit of time. I said, let's go next door and I've got a long day. I want to get some eggs or something. John says, great. He's got the violin case. We go next door. He sits. I had a couple of eggs. He only had a cup of coffee. So he said, you know, I'm going to go and get ready because you have your accordion up there already. So John goes back. I finish my breakfast, uh, go back to the studio, press the button, and uh, the elevator comes down. <laughs> Uh, for all of those, this is the slowest elevator in the world, all the people know it. But anyway, John rushes out and uh, he had opened his violin case and there was no violin in the case. <laughs> so we've got about 10 minutes and Alan is waiting, uh, smiling, and uh, John was working with um, uh, Herb Ellis and Monty Alexander and Ray Brown over at the uh, Jazz Showcase. So. He gets a cab, rushes over there, and he said, I think I know where it is. And he goes into the room, and he said, it's in the piano, it's in the piano. So he looks in the piano, it's not in the piano. Will you shut up? <laughs> he said, no lights. What the hell is the difference? <laughs> there were no lights in the room. <laughs> so, cannot find the uh, violin, goes back out to the registration desk and begins to uh, ask the uh, man at the desk what he can do or what security. As he's talking to the gentleman, he looks past him and the violin is propped up against the wall behind the, uh, behind the, uh, the travel, uh, behind the clerk. So he jumped back in the cab and we were, I don't know, 15 minutes late or something. I think that deserves a round of applause. Uh, my last remark is, uh, I was very, very surprised to see that uh, you're beginning to sell your paintings. I mean, everybody thinks he's busy morning, uh, noon, and night. And actually, very confidentially, we had a talk. And uh, things aren't going. It's a little slow. The jobbing said, how's jobbing? He said, well, I had one last week, and it's a little slower this week. <laughs> but uh, for many years, uh, I wanted to even be fact, before I began working with John on, on a steady basis, I always admired his paintings. I used to call him and I said, I would like to buy one. Naturally, he used to fluff me off then. But that's all right, John. It's nothing. I, I, I passed on that. But now I understand that he's going to sell all those paintings, those beautiful paintings in Universal. And he confidentially told me that if any of you are interested, You've got about one week because he told me that the numbers are starting to show through the, uh, through the colors. <laughs> so you better get them now. John, I love you and you know I do. Joe Vito. Joe Vito. Joey, very good. Very good. I, I like Italians who look Italian, don't you? I do. I like Italians who look Italian. I talk Italian. <clears throat> look like Italian, Joe. I, when I grew up in Harvey, we were never, ever afraid of the guys from Winnetka. <laughs> How can you be afraid of a guy from Winnetka? Listen to this. Skippy Blakely's going to kill you. <laughs> we were afraid of the guys from Melrose Park. <laughs> Nunzio Vaducci wants to talk to you. That'll do it. That'll do it. Good, good, good story, Joe. Funny stuff. One was kind of long, but, but it was good. It was a good story. If I could make sex last that long, I'd be the next Steve Garvey boy. It's good stuff. Now, what the hell are we told? Now, and you had to blow his one. He had a great punchline here on Cup. 
Well, he just saw my whole punchline on selling on uh, numbers starting to show through. Oh, you were going to do that joke, the numbers? He robbed your material, huh? So you nailed him on that cup line. We're even. Oh, we're even. Yeah, you guys are even. We're even. Yeah. This is Kapu. I, 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 you know, I grew up in the city listening to Irv Cups and Jack Brickhouse narrating the Bear Games. And thanks to those two guys, there are thousands of kids in this city who still know nothing about football. <laughs> You remember those games? It's fourth down, one yard to go, Cup. Fourth down, one yard to go. Will the Bears go for a field goal? Will they go for the touchdown? I don't know, Cup. I don't know. I know they got good pizza at Arnie's Pizza. <laughs> and all Cup said for 24 years was three words. You remember what they were? That's right, Jack. That's right, Jack. <laughs> 24 years. That's right, Jack. Bears ball. That's right, Jack. Looks like a pass play. That's right, Jack. You're an asshole, Cup. That's right, Jack. I'd like to bring up our next, this next gentleman. Of course, you, jeez, you probably don't know who he is. We haven't heard his name all evening long, you know. Marty Fay is a legend, truly a legend. He interviewed me when I first started out shit. He interviewed Abraham Lincoln when he first started out. <laughs> Don't, don't give that speech at Gettysburg. I'm telling you, it won't go over. I'm telling you, it's a shit speech. I read it. This is a guy. This is a guy that... I, I'm going to tell you a true story. This morning, Frankie Avalon's a good buddy of mine. Frankie Avalon called me about a, a gig he and I are going to do together. He called me at the Ambassador East. And I said to him, he said, what are you doing? And I told him what I was doing tonight. And he told me to tell everybody hello. And I said, he said, who's on the dais? And I'm going down. And I got the Marty Faye. He said, Tommy, Marty Faye. He said, I'm 16 years old. I'm scared to death. I had a record out before Venus, before he became a hit, a record called Shy Guy, he said, or something like that. He said, I came to Chicago. Here's this guy, Marty Faye. Everybody tells me he can make or break a career. He said, I sat down. I said, hi, Mr. Faye. We were on the air live. He put my record on. He played four bars, took it off, and smashed it. <laughs> and said, that's the worst piece of crap I've ever heard in my whole life. And then he said to me, welcome to Chicago. <laughs> Frankie Avalon, he did that too. It was an amazing kid. He had, Frankie Avalon's a kid. Frankie Avalon has eight kids. You know that, don't you? He has eight children, which is amazing. What's amazing is he looks like a kid himself. And I have three children, and I'm proud to announce we found out last Friday that two of my three children are Frankie Avalon's also. <laughs> But this man is a long, long time disc jockey in Chicago. He had the first late night music and talk TV show. And I said jazz promoter bon vivant, joking uh, here a little while ago. But Marty truly is, is, is uh, always was out there pushing for the little guy and pushing for the guys who weren't being heard a lot. And also telling it like he thought it was, right or wrong, it was his, his mind speaking. He's always been that way. He's a delight and a great, great Chicago favorite. Marty Faye, ladies and gentlemen. Please, that I got dressed for the occasion. How many kids has Frank Avalon got? Eight. Screws better than he sings. <laughs> the kills still can't sing worth a shit. Plays trumpet. Got to roll with a Jew's harp. <laughs> this is supposed to be a roast. Now, I know roasts. This is a love-in. <laughs> Johnny, you're an asshole. Yeah! Get him, Marty! all this shit. I come in here, Johnny, a poet, and he plays the violin, he plays the bass, and he went to Tokyo. Who gives a shit where you went? 
The food was great. You're still an asshole. <laughs> Gotta buy his bullshit paintings. What is that? Tony Bennett paints. Everybody's painting. Can you do three rooms for sixty dollars? <laughs> Happily, I arrived in Chicago. January of 1952, where I checked into the Croydon. Oh, one of my friends told me that was the spot. What? I left my wife at home because I was only going to stay three weeks to see what was doing here. And the first night I was at the Croydon, four dollars a night show you how things were then. How much were the rooms? I just... <laughs> yeah, I gotta play straight man for you, you son of a bitch, you died up here. Get his ass out of here. <laughs> and the first night, there was a lot of noise in the aisles, down the halls, doing. I opened the door, and ice capades broads are running up and down the halls. <laughs> nothing on but ice skates. I called New York, and I said to my wife, ain't nothing doing here. You might as well stay there. But the first, I did 70 commercials a week then, which endeared me to the lives of every Chicagoan. Loved me for that. Broke into the Who Gibson movies, broke into the Ken Maynard movies, and all the schmucks are watching those movies, and I'm selling them vacuum cleaners and sewing machines and pots and pans. They loved me. But one night, at one of the studios, I said to, to uh, Richie Victor, I said, where can I hear some good jazz? And he said, you have to go on North Sheridan Road or the Streamliner. I said, where's North Sheridan Road? He says, a place called the Lealoa. And I went out to the Lealoa. And let me tell you something. That's when I heard Lucy Reed sing Lazy Afternoon and Inchworm. I can't remember what the shit I did 20 minutes ago, but that I remember. <laughs> and I fell in love with her. God, she was gorgeous. Still are. Wow, was she gorgeous, built like a brick crapper. And could she sing? <laughs> and then when I took my eyes off of her, I looked at the stage. And I see this big, fat, elephant on the piano. <laughs> I mean a mastodon. You couldn't see the piano seat for his ass. <laughs> and then I looked over to the right. I see this stoop-shouldered, bald, very ugly. <laughs> I mean, this sucker was ugly. <laughs> Tell me his name is Johnny Frigo. Gorgeous singer, singing her ass off in a place with palm trees. Okay, singing inchworm with palm trees and Hawaiian drinks. Nobody knew what they were doing. Here she is with a guy that looks like a furniture mover. And over here looks like an underwear salesman at Fields. Then I found out Marx was a piano mover. And Johnny Frigo was a pimp at the Croydon.
how you play. Very good. It is, it is so good in this day and age when our educational system is under attack for college students graduating who can't even read or write to hear somebody who's long time been on radio and television describe <laughs> ladies with extraordinary figures as broads who are built like a brick ship house. <laughs> God, they don't write them like that anymore. I'll tell you. <laughs> Marty uh, uh, interviewed uh, Tim Reed. Now, I was with a comedy team. Some of you know Tim Reed, uh, who played Venus Flytrap on WKRP Cincinnati, and was on Frank's Place, and now has his own show, another show called Snoop, coming out. But Tim and I were America's uh, first black and white comedy team. And uh, now there's been many. Dukakis and Jackson was hot there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but Marty would interview us, and uh, Tim and I worked, uh, we worked, you know, all the clubs everywhere we could. There were no comedy clubs in those days, so we had to work wherever we could in this city and uh, beg for jobs, actually. We worked all white audiences on the north and south side, but we worked all black audiences, too. Uh, the Guys and Gals, the High Chaparral, the Burning Spear, Dating Club Lounge, where I was the only white guy uh, within miles. I was the world's fastest human from the parking lot into the stage every day. But, but uh, black audiences are, are different than white audiences. I, 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 uh, I just recorded an album in front of an all-black audience at a jazz club in Harvey called Benji's, and there were no white people in the audience. I did it for a reason, but the album is called That White Boy is Crazy. And, and I went back to an all-black club because for years when I made the so-called big time, white people constantly asked me, do black people laugh at your material? Because I used to work in all-black clubs and I grew up in an all-black neighborhood, so I used to do routines about that. But I found earlier in my career that a lot of comedians, uh, certainly white comedians, never knew that there are differences between white audiences and black audiences. And, uh, uh, you know, the difference, uh, white audiences, or black audiences in their entirety are different because they react to what you're saying. Not heckling, but they react to what you're saying. If you say something up here, they feel compelled to say something out there. I mean, it's like the amen corner in church to them. <laughs> it's true, if you come up here and say something, if you go in front of an all-black audience and you say, I just got in from St. Louis, somebody will holler out, my brother lives in St. Louis. <laughs> and then someone will say, my sister lives in St. Louis. And you'll say, maybe she knows my brother. <laughs> and then they talk among themselves for like 20 minutes like that. <laughs> And don't go to a Broadway play with your black friends because they will talk to the actors on the stage. <laughs> and they'll give away the plot. <laughs> the bitch got a knife in her purse, man. But I did, we did Marty's show, and Marty plugged our first and only album Tim and I ever had together. It went into the dumper, uh, but uh, well, we had a lot of fun. Marty taught us a lot about the business in those days. And now, to keep moving on with the program, we have a couple other fellas, and then this evening will be over. Uh, and then we'll bring up, of course, John to make sure this evening is over. You know. <laughs> this is a gentleman, ladies and gentlemen, who's a pianist, a jingle producer, and a longtime friend, Dick Boyal, ladies and gentlemen. Dick Boyal. I'm sure glad I didn't plan on trying to be funny tonight because nothing could be worse than being in this kind of a position coming in the last minute after all these uh, very wonderful, artistic, funny comedians. However... <laughs> no, as you can tell, I'm a little nervous because it's very difficult for me to wear a tuxedo under these conditions. Number one, I didn't come in through the kitchen. <laughs> with the guests. <laughs> and I still have that funny feeling that one of the lovely uh, female singers in the audience is going to ask me to sit down and accompany them uh, like the song is you, up a fourth. <laughs> I can imagine what her face would be like when I get to the bridge. Uh, actually, uh, the only thing that uh, I can bring that's maybe something of newsworthy is that I heard yesterday that the Toulouse restaurant starting tomorrow night is going to uh, 
have a new item on their menu called the John Frigo Roast. It's, uh, it's going to be very tasty. Uh, you have to order it 24 hours ahead of time. <laughs> it's going to be very well done and satisfaction guaranteed. And the reason it's special is that when you order it, the captain, the head waiter, and the chef is going to come to your table with a cart and lift this big silver cover, but there will be nothing in it. <laughs> you see, the chef forgot to cook it. <laughs> So he gets in a taxi and runs home and gets it and then brings it back. There's, there's no real way to bring any really, uh, really authentic humor to this unless I set up this little vignette for you. Um, we all are very much aware of John's great ability as a violinist, a bass player, a painter, a poet. There's no one in the world that plays tuba like John. <laughs> but uh, about two, three years ago, <clears throat> when we were still working with live musicians, oh, I, had, uh, I, had a, uh, I had a recording session where the client was an hour late because he missed his flight. The musicians by that time were two and a half hours over time. And all I needed to finish the spot was one little musical accent. Uh, and so I asked John to help me out. And uh, as he came toward the microphone, a hush fell over the studio, which we all admit is very rare. <laughs> and I kept a tape of what this was. It's, uh, I'd like to call this uh, John Frigo's Relentless Quest for Perfection. Sure hope this works. Wait a minute. Hey, something happened to my thing here. Oh, boy. Oh. It moved, and it's, it's off-center.
so far tonight, you've been, I wrote this down, you've been a puppet, a poet, a pirate, a pauper, a pawn, and a king. <laughs> That's got a good yeah, they'll never make it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wrote two songs seriously in my life. Uh, a country western song, Take Your Tongue Out of My Mouth, Baby, I Was Kissing You Goodbye. <laughs> and Those Shoes I Paid For Are Walking Out On Me was another one. <laughs> did, you write, did you write, if your phone don't ring, it's me? <laughs> if your phone don't ring, it's me? <laughs> Right over here, we have Dick Boyle, who's 
done so many craft commercials that every morning he gargles with Miracle Whip. <laughs> uh, of course, there's Dick Reynolds. Uh, Dick and I went away to basic training together. Uh, we even went through the obstacle course together in the Air Force. And Dick exhibited such cowardice that as we were boarding a plane to fly back to Chicago, I heard our drill instructors referring to him as the Air Force's answer to Private Eddie Slovak. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not alienating anybody. This is all in good fun. Uh, <laughs> seated right over here is a very eminent this Jackie, Marty Fay. Who's a, Marty hasn't been in good health uh, for the past few years. He's had uh, several bypasses. I don't know if you're aware of it. As a matter of fact, Marty's had so many bypasses that he now has a zipper on his chest. And. Uh, when he's scheduled for his next one, the little eyelet on the end of the zipper, he intends to ha uh, hang a tag there that says, Attention, Surgeon, please use zipper. Murray Allen, who was a uh, jobbing date saxophone player yeah. before he bought Universal Studios, Murray decided to get out of the business when he found that his uh, local music store would no longer sell him zinc reeds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, really, Murray is a, a real nice guy, except when you're on a recording session with him. Then he has the personality of Pol Pot. You <laughs> like that. And finally, uh, Joe Vito. Uh, Joe and I play a lot of golf together, and uh, Joe usually slices his ball into the woods. And the only way I can describe this is that uh, watching Joe try to hit his ball out of the woods back onto the fairway is like watching a bulldozer try to clear a Brazilian rainforest. So that's about it. Oh my God. Uh, now we're going to start with my dad. Uh, first of all, if it hadn't have been for me, uh, we would not be honoring him tonight. And this is the truth. Uh, seven years ago, I saved his life on a jobbing date. I arrived there and... Uh, he was playing the uh, dinner with Bobby Schiff. And uh, they sat down while I was setting up my drums to have their dinner. And I sat over at the table after I set my drums up. And I happened to look over at my dad, and he had a strange expression on his face. And I said, are you all right? And he shook his head, no. And I said, are, are you choking? And he shook his head, yes. And I said, can you breathe? And he went, barely. So I said, well, I don't know what to do except the Heimlich maneuver, which I've never done before. He said, let's go out in the parking lot. So we walked out into this parking lot. It was a hot, sultry summer night. He took his jacket off, and he was gasping for air, and the color in his face was starting to change. And I started performing the Heimlich maneuver on him. And for five minutes, I did that until I was drenched in sweat. And finally, he spit out a piece of beef. And I said, are you all right? And he said, I'm not sure. So I gave him a glass of water to drink, and he drank it, and the water immediately shot out of his nostrils, so I knew there was still a blockage in there. I only tell you this story so that you'll understand the high regard that my father has for me. So I knew that I had to continue with the Heimlich maneuver. I did it for another four minutes, and he was actually turning blue at that point. And suddenly, another piece of meat flew out of his mouth. And I could see him start to breathe again. And I said, are you all right? And he said, yes, I am. And then he looked at his watch and said, hey, guys, we're late. And walked right back into the banquet hall. Never once did he thank me.
first Italian American to do that. And he described to me in detail what it was like for him. In the interest of keeping this description in good taste, I'll just tell you this briefly. It was very difficult walk for him walking into that cubicle with his specimen jar and his picture of Lillian Gish. <laughs> seconds later, with the special jar filled and Lillian's picture safely tucked in his wallet, his fame in the history of, uh, in the annals of medicine was assured. And I tell you this because to this very day, every Father's Day, he receives a card from a syringe at the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> Everybody thinks of uh, my father as being pure as driven snow, but uh, he has strayed a few times. Um, he had a tempestuous affair with a French horn player about 15 years ago. Uh, it lasted for about a year, and then he finally broke it off. I asked him why, and uh, he told me that he had to. He said that every time she kissed him, she shoved her fist up his ass. <laughs> In the interest of keeping this as brief as possible, I do want to say this to you, Dad. You are one of a kind. You're a gentleman, a compassionate man, and a caring man. Uh, you're a musician whose music has spanned six generations, and you've brought joy to thousands of people. Uh, you're an inspiration to young players. I've seen you many times talking to young players. Uh, you've been on more commercials than just about any musician in this town. And in spite of that, some people here still like you. <laughs> <laughs> and as uh, to echo what some others have said before me, he really, truly is at ease playing country music as he is playing jazz as he is playing rock and roll. Uh, in the last few years, he's been discovered nationally while the Chicago mu musical community has always known what a treasure he was. Now they say that uh, a son should try and fill his father's boots. My dad's sister, Dolly, who's sitting right at that table over there, gave these to me when I married my wife, Daryl. Uh, these, these are the boots that my dad wore as a young boy. I'll tell you something, not only can I, can I fill the boots he wears today, I can't even begin to fill these. You're a great man, and I love you dearly. Oh, yeah. Eric! Halfway through the bit, I heard you saying, geez, I wish I'd have used the rubber. I heard you say <laughs>
uh, I sort of looked over uh, Tom Greeson's notes when he started making those ethnic jokes, and I did have him switch one of them because for one moment I would like to be serious. For one moment. Uh, the ethnic jokes are great, you know, they're funny, they're funny, but they, they really hurt people. And especially the, the, the ethnic community that has got the worst of this are naturally the Polish jokes. And I wanted to hear and I wanted to uh, put on tape that I really resent Polish jokes because I've been to Poland on my vacation. <coughs> and, and it is a very wonderful country, especially now everything's happening in the papers. It's a very wonderful country. It's full of national treasures and cultural landmarks. I saw the tomb of the unknown bowler. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, Chicago's a big city, and I do, I have wondered why they chose me uh, to be roasted or honored, whatever you want to call it tonight. And it might be because of the modicum of talent I have. I, th I think I have some. And for that, I've been around an awful, awful long time. And uh, as Johnny Carson asked me the first time I was on the show, or the second time I was on the show, uh, why I took so long uh, to, uh, to do this thing. And in all reality, out of the top of my head, I said, subconsciously, I said, the, the paper said, you've been playing most of your life, but it's only been, what, the last months or something that you That's became really well known. How, how come? Why? Well, I guess I wanted to take as long as I could in my life so I wouldn't have time to become a has-been, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> no, good thinking. Good thinking. That's <clears throat> nice And I think in a way that's true. <laughs> And also, there's uh, the longevity, been around for a long time. And uh, because of that, I've learned thousands and thousands of tunes. Joe and I keep going on, and we keep picking tunes out of the air that we haven't done in years and years. And I really feel that I can honestly say that I know, well, music has been around for, what, centuries? Centuries. And I believe that I know the first note of every song that was ever written in the history of music. If you don't hold me to the original key. <laughs> and uh, I just happened to be young. I finished early last night on my job. I played at the Field Museum and I came home and I caught the end of Miss America, which reminded me that many of you don't know that, but I used to go steady with the Miss America. So I think that's something. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. There were only 13 states at the time. <laughs> okay, uh, this is weird. I got all the lights making us real hot up here, and my paintings are there in the dark. So what are you going to do? But on the way out, you can look at them because, as Joe said, uh, you know, this is the time to buy them because they are already going. And if Jasper Johns can do a stupid little American flag like this for $50 million, and Van Gogh can do irises about this big for $48 million, I don't have that kind of track record. So I'm just selling mine for $2,500,000. <laughs> And uh, the frames are extra. <laughs> uh, anyway, what am I going to do here? But this is the last. Oh, I, I have. Uh, it has been a big year for me, I have to admit that. Uh, I guess it started with the recording sessions and the jazz albums and the Carson show. I'm only bringing that up for a reason. And uh, during the uh, Grammys, uh, I won the, uh, I didn't win because it's not a contest, but I was given the prestigious Governor's Award and uh, I was featured on this all-star band tour of Japan. And now this honor, 
and it's probably as high, it's not quite as high as I can go because next week is my really biggie. And starting at 8 o'clock, I'll be doing a bar mitzvah at Temple Gear Rudy Metro <laughs> in Spokane. I'm trying to think. 
think of what uh, these roasters have done. I remember Marty Fay when he was on his TV program. I'm sure he remembers this, and a few people happened to catch that live program where somebody happened to pat his belly and said, you're getting a little uh, heavy up there, reached over to this very romantic singer and pulled off his toupee on TV. <laughs> yeah, Russ Carlisle. Russ Carlisle. Oh, he's met. I, I knew his name, but I didn't want to mention it. Russ Carlisle. That's right. And uh, Marty Fay actually pulled off his toupee on TV. And uh, that's really gross. That is really gross, and I've been meaning to tell him that for many years. So let's hear it for uh, the, 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 the epitome of grossness. Now, Dick Marks, you know, we all know Dick Marks. We were a duo for many, 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 many years. Was supposed to have been here tonight, but I won't go into the reason, but something happened just before uh, this program that uh, caused Dick not to be able to be here. And on his way back to California. But Dick was a very big, imposing fellow that sort of sent the chills down a lot of people. So, and uh, for all the years we were together, uh, there was a click in our duo, and I wasn't in it. Symphony critiques it as a need should be, judging just what's there to see or hear, not flaunt his pedantry. Where or where is that critic who, when in the course of what he's doing, one review and certain praise plays, doesn't swap his inner praise for some clever caustic phrase? And those reviews on modern art? No, what? Mom? Mom? It's show me him, I oh. beg. <laughs> I got it. Show me him, I beg of you. One not averse to simply do a fair appraisal of a play. No ego getting in the way, upstaging things he's paid to say. How about that? Yeah. 
and those reviews on modern art, what mumbo jumbo they impart. Words as vague as cosmic void. Is this the reason they're employed to outdo Jung, to outdo Freud? <laughs> I'm sure the artist, quite befuddled after reading all those muddled words of which he's not acquainted, uttered just before he fainted. God, is that what I just painted? <laughs> In closing, please don't feel untoward for my going overboard. Let's just cool it with the ego. Yours sincerely, Johnny Frigo. <laughs> And you singers are also welcome to come and uh, 
join in the songs anyway. Now, because we, we do all these things, we hone our, I guess you'd call it our craft, our art to a certain perfection because you play in, and each night you hear little nuances of chords that you feel could be better than what you played the night before. And after working together for so many years, you develop, I mean, a real definitive sense of what what a song should really be played like, and we'd like to do this medley for you now. Is this okay, Joe? Huh? Yeah. And uh, these are the long glasses. What is this? Uh, opening up with Frida by flashlight. <laughs> Okay, go uh, Can you give me an arpeggio? Uh, I'm the accordion. <laughs>
I hope it doesn't turn into that. But there is a very serious problem in this country, and I swear to God that eventually it is going to be changed. It's been asked about by thousands and thousands of people for years and years, and it's regarding our national anthem. And we're talking to the Society of Singers, so this is for real, gang. And, and uh, if and most of you are familiar with this, even either through school books or what, but actually the anthem was not really approved by Congress until very, very recently, I think 1930 or something. So we're only talking about a few generations to change, to change this. And if you know that Francis Scott Key actually took a melody that was a, a, a drinking song in an English alehouse in the 1700s, and the words were about, uh, the words were regarding Anacreon, who was the dirty man of Greek poetry. So we're talking about a borrowed song that was a drinking song about booze with dirty lyrics, and we're also talking about a song that is un, it has too much range, and uh, it has, and the words are, the the accents are on the wrong syllable. There's many, there are many things wrong with our national anthem, and this is the honest to God's truth, and it's not sacrilegious or unpatriotic to talk about this. And uh, uh, I have decided that Francis Scott Key is not really dead because if he were dead, he, he, he has too much uh, guilt riding over him to be able to sleep peacefully because of what he's done to thousands and thousands of singers throughout the country. <laughs> really, this is the honest to God's truth. So if he is still alive and squirming in his grave, I would like to say this to uh, Francis Scott Key, okay? I'm not, I'm not a sing I'm not a singer. Uh, this is what I'd like to say to... Mr. Francis Scott Key, it's a mystery to me why the nation accepted your oath, say, can you see? Though some talent you've got, Ira Gershwin, you're not. Cause the way that the words fit the music ain't so hot. And please tell me, my friend, cause I can't comprehend why a song about booze for the anthem you penned? Oh, say does our star-spangled banner not crave a better song with better words for this home of the Because you love Johnny Frigo, and a lot of you stood because your underwear has been riding up your credit. 